Hi there team and welcome to an update on a not hugely significant geologic event but one I wanted to focus on a little bit because it's so close to where I live here in southern Idaho. Today on February 26 at about 10:25 a.m. there was a magnitude 4.9 earthquake located in western Idaho so I thought we'd break it down a little bit do a brief update on this earthquake <clears throat> excuse me where it occurred why it occurred and look a little bit at the geology there so uh, it's not often in Idaho we are the top dog for the week when it comes to the biggest earthquake this is a map showing uh, earthquakes over four and a half in magnitude over the past week you can see there's one here in Alaska that was a 4.6 and here we have the earthquake of interest a 4.9 this was located just north of Smith's Ferry Idaho so a couple hours north of Boise, Idaho, if you're familiar with that area, and a pretty mountainous country right near the North Fork of the Payette River. So we're going to look at this earthquake's uh, data a bit here, break it down, look at some of the effects. It was minimally felt by people in the Treasure Valley of south, southwestern Idaho over into Oregon a little bit. So not a dangerous earthquake by any means, but an interesting one because we don't always get earthquakes here in Idaho. There's something, uh, I wouldn't say they're an anomaly, but they're not as common as they are in other places, even though we rank six in the U.S. in terms of earthquake frequency. So let's start with uh, some of the data here. Um, let's go ahead and show you exactly where that earthquake took place. So here is Boise, uh, and this map showing the last week and all the earthquakes, but you can see this cluster here. There's Boise. This is uh, Cascade Lake right here. Uh, this is Smith's Ferry just down in this area. And then we have this large earthquake here, the 4.9 that occurred again this morning uh, on Monday, February 26. Um, a couple aftershocks have occurred in the hours since then. Looks like we've got maybe uh, seven or so. I think there's two nested under there. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven earthquakes that are we're going to be classified as aftershocks. Obviously, smaller magnitude, mainly ones and twos. This 4.9 was a shallow earthquake, about nine kilometers depth, so about five and a half miles down. Uh, and we'll look at some of the data here from the earthquake. Again, it didn't cause any strong shaking, but people did feel it. It's considered sort of a weak to light shaking uh, quake in terms of its magnitude or intensity, I suppose. And in terms of just 4.9, where that sits on the magnitude scale, probably considered a light to almost a moderate earthquake. When you usually get into the five range, it's considered a moderate earthquake. So a couple things we can see here, one of which is of interest to me is the what we call the moment tensor solution or the fault plane solution. We also call these beach balls informally. This shows us that this earthquake that happened today actually occurred along a strike slip fault. So rather than the rocks failing and slipping up and down across that fault plane, the movement was side to side. And based on the orientation of this fault plane solution, we either have a right lateral strike slip fault. So things are being shifted to the right if this is the correct fault plane here, this east-west fault plane, then things shifted to the right. Or the other solution that's possible is it was a nearly north-south fault that had uh, left lateral motion. So one of those two matches up. In a few minutes here, I'll show you the geologic map that might help make a little bit of sense of this as well. So uh, that's our fault plane solution. Um, we can also look at the the shake map, so when people felt this earthquake here in southern Idaho today, you can actually get onto the USGS website, fill out a short survey about how you felt the earthquake, um, and then all that data is aggregated and it generates the shake map that we see here. So there were 904 responses, at least so far, uh, plotted in these different geographic grids based on people's locations. And then at the bottom here, what you can see, maybe I'll make this a, a little bit bigger for you. Um, you can see this gradational scale. So this is the intensity scale, a little different than magnitude. Magnitude just measures how much energy the earthquake released when it occurred. The intensity level is how the shaking was manifested. So in different parts of the region, 
how the shaking was perceived by people. And this can be affected by a number of factors, including um, what you're doing when the earthquake takes place, what kind of house you are in or structure in terms of wood frame, steel, brick. Um, excuse me, a couple other factors might be the subsurface geology. So the types of rocks or sediments underneath your location and how that seismic energy is being transmitted. But we can see, you know, there's one report of some strong, strongest shaking here. In general, though, you can see it's mainly these purples kind of around the periphery, which would be weak shaking, intensity level two to three. And then a little bit of the, the kind of teal green which would be in the, the light to maybe almost moderate category. So uh, with this amount of shaking, no damage is expected, and I haven't seen any reports of any damage, certainly no injuries or fatalities. Um, my guess is with this quake's depth and magnitude, it was one of those quakes where if you were stationary, sitting still, and you know perhaps not too distracted, you probably felt it to some degree, but if you were moving, uh, you were in motion, doing different things, you maybe possibly didn't feel it at all. So there's the intensity map for the earthquake. Uh, if we go back here, they may have that plotted up already. Uh, looks like not quite yet. They don't have a, a good shake map for that yet. Uh, anything else here? So I don't think so. Um, so in considering this fault plane solution here, what I did is I went and found a geologic map of the area and this is from some number of years ago I think this is from yeah the 70s 1974 but let's first let's um let me show you where this quake is on let's see which map did I have that was going to be a good one here let's go to this one this one might work just as well so here we have uh, Cascade Reservoir um, and you can see the North Fork of the Payette here and then we have Tripod Peak. So the main shock, the main earthquake here, the biggest one, is right on the flank of this Tripod Peak. So now let's kind of remember where that is as we switch over to the geologic map. And I'll probably need to zoom in a little bit on here. So geologic maps are maps that um, have been put together that show the geology um, of what's exposed at the surface. And so if we come in here, you can come up here and you can see Cascade Reservoir. And then if we scroll down a little bit, there's that, it's a little hard to read probably. Let me try zooming in a little bit more for you folks. Um, that Tripod Peak uh, Summit is right about here. So there are a few known and mapped faults, these northwest trend or northeast trending faults here. Um, but remember our seismic data indicates that the earthquake occurred on a strike slip um, fault. So we either have uh, something that's oriented northwest southeast that's moving to the left as you look across the fault or in a I guess southwest to northeast trending fault that moves things to the right. So it's a little hard to conclude anything here um, I wonder though, you can see where there's another fault system down here and we've got this one here and there's, they're not connected through here. And of course this is all in granite so it's very difficult to trace some of these faults through granite because the granite, granitic rock is so um, uniform and without any sort of marker units or something that shows offset it's often really times, it's oftentimes very difficult to see where the faults might be. So there may be a structure that trends uh, southwest to northeast across here that links these two together. There could be a small transform or strike slip fault that connects this fault system to this one. Again, just playing around looking at the data, um, we, we may not know that for some time, but just looking at what's known about the geology there and what we saw with today's earthquake and may, making some interpretations that may or may not be valid, but just something to consider and maybe look at. Um, this earthquake was not large enough to create a surface displacement, so none of the ground was broken. There's nothing on the ground to see. Even though it was a very shallow earthquake, it was still fairly weak in terms of its magnitude. And finally, just to wrap up this brief update, if you're wondering if earthquakes in Idaho sound a little bit familiar, that's because we did have a swarm of earthquakes. We had a big earthquake 
in March of 2020, March 30th of 2020, shown by the big blue dot here. Let me zoom back out so you kind of get a little better geographic orientation. Here's Boise, Twin Falls, the central mountains of Idaho. The earthquake today, interestingly, um, was pretty close to this small cluster here, just a little bit further to the north. Um, but the big event in 2020 was this earthquake near Stanley, Idaho. And then all these gray dots here, what I did is I plotted up earthquakes for the entire year from the main event on March 31st, 2020, all the way to March 31st of 2021. And so these are all essentially aftershocks. And you can see a couple of trends here. There's a uh, northwest southeast trend here. And this lines up pretty well with the sawtooth fault, the actual main normal fault that's responsible for the uplift of the, the Sawtooth Mountains. But there's also some other trends in here as well uh, that are interesting. But just wanted to make you aware that this part of Idaho does receive earthquakes. So today's earthquake comes as no surprise. Uh, we had a much bigger one in 2020, a few tens of miles to the east. That earthquake and today's earthquake, there's no reason to believe that they're related or connected in any way, shape, or form other than they both took place in broadly uh, the ge same general area in central Idaho. And we'll have to see as time goes on how many of these uh, aftershocks pop up here. Um, looks like, again, there's been maybe eight now since I've been talking. There's might have been another one that popped up there. Uh, but generally, you know, just a few aftershocks. It'll be interesting to see if these aftershocks, as they populate the map, do they define the fault? Do they actually line up in sort of some sort of linear or nearly linear trend that actually designates and um, uh, defines the actual fault? Uh, again, th this trend here, there's only a couple dots here, so it's way too early to make any assumptions, but uh, quite possibly it was that uh, southwest to northeast trending uh, right lateral strikes at fault that was responsible. But we'll have to see uh, over the next couple of weeks. But aftershocks should be expected. The aftershocks are very small, ones and twos. Those probably aren't even being felt by anyone. Uh, so not a huge event, but something I wanted to spend a few minutes on just because it happened here close to where I'm at here in Idaho. And it's kind of rare that uh, we're we're the big earthquake capital for the week. So for this week, if you look at magnitude 4.5 earthquakes, there's one up in Alaska, but a slightly bigger one here in Idaho. So, so that's kind of cool, uh, pretty fun. So I hope you enjoyed that. hope I gave some interesting perspective on this earthquake that happened today, February 26th here in Western Idaho. Thanks again for tuning in. Appreciate you liking and subscribing, sharing this with others who might be interested. If anything else happens of significance, I'll be sure to jump back on and share my thoughts and interpretations with you. Thanks so much.